where we come again to this great first epistle written to the church as Jewish believers are transitioning from what they've known, the shadows and the symbols, the things that would point to the Messiah. Then the Messiah has come. They have believed in the Messiah who died in their place, the Lamb of God who takes away their sin, and now risen again, ushered into the church. Now, they ask, what do we do now? What do we do now? And James writes this letter and writes to these Jewish believers scattered across the known world, and he writes to them and he says, Well, what you know is that you should be wise. You should be wise. And helps them to distinguish what it means to be wise with wisdom from above. Because there are lots of different ideas that were floating around, lots of different uh, opinions about what it meant to be wise, what it meant to demonstrate wisdom. And James comes and definitively gives them There's the wisdom from above, and then there's earthly wisdom, which is demonic. He calls them and instructs them and encourages them to walk wisely with wisdom from above. And as we've been coming to this passage, we have been right out the gate. James doesn't mess around, and he immediately enters into, well, what does it mean to walk wisely through trials? We're not sure, but most likely... They were having trials being scattered across, having moved and being forced away from their home, from the land that they loved. They were scattered across the known world into a different culture, most likely a pagan culture. And there are pressures, pressures to compromise, pressures to go back to what they knew in in trusting in their works and the obedience of the law for their salvation. So he tells them, this is what it means to walk wisely through trials. And as we've been talking and reading this passage over and over again, I hope that it has been encouragement and a strength to your own heart as you go through your own trials. So let's read the passage before us in chapter 1, starting in verse 2. And again, I'm going to add what we have learned in our translation would be uh, helpful as an amplified translation. James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it nothing but joy, my brethren, whenever you fall into the midst of and are completely surrounded by unexpectedly multicolored trials, because you know that the approved part of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich brother is to glory in his humiliation, because, like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. The Lord has promised those who love him. As we've been walking through this passage, as you know, we have seen this wisdom principle presented, you need to have a joy-filled life. When you walk through trials, and when I walk through trials, for believers, we need this joy-filled life. We need to count it nothing but joy. This is a command from God. The reason why we can count it nothing but joy is because we are confident in what God is doing and his purpose. And so then we trust God, and in verses 5 through 8, we, we learn this wisdom principle is expanded upon, we need a faith-filled life. To have this joy-filled life, 
walking wisely through trials, we need to trust God and have a faith-filled life. We ought not to doubt. We ought not to waver between trusting God fully and then trusting God partially or tr not trusting in something else. We, we ought to trust in God fully. Then, in verses 9 through 11, James answers the question that's asked, well, what does this look like? How, how can you, in the midst of rubber meets the road, day-to-day -day trials, count it nothing but joy? What does that look like? And what does that look like as it pertains to financial trials? And James illustrates then this wisdom principle, and he says, to walk wisely with joy, trusting in God, you need to be totally dependent on God. And then finally, in verse 12, he'll sum up everything in saying, you need to be driven by the eschaton, the last thing. You need to be driven by what is to come in the end, the, in the eternal state. So, <clears throat> we made some observations. Again, James is only talking to believers. There is no hope, there is no solid ground for unbelievers in the midst of the trials that they go through in life. All that they have, as the song writer wrote, everything else is sinking sand. And this is only for believers. And even though he's talking about financial trials, we understand that this is just one illustration of the many multicolored, multi-shaded, faceted trials that we can go through. Because not all of you are going through financial trials. Some of you are going through other trials, family relationships, health struggles, and whatnot. So this example, illustration of financial trials is not limited to just finances. We can broad, broaden it out applicationally to other trials. And so, as he transitions, he says, instead of wavering and doubting and being an unstable person, a double-souled person, unstable in all their ways, instead of being that, what you should rather do then is the glory. And he talks to the rich, or to the poor brother first, and the poor brother should glory in his high position. When times are lean, when times are lacking and sparse, they should hold up their head high, confident, confidently proclaiming, loudly professing, that they have everything that they need because they have a high position in Christ. It isn't that they don't feel the pain, as we mentioned. They do. But that is not the weightiest thing in their life. That is not the driving anchor, uh, the anchor that holds their soul. What holds their soul is that they are in Christ. So then we've transitioned to talking about well, what happens if you're rich? And as we mentioned in the, in the grammar, this is the rich brother. What should they do? Well, they should do the same thing. They should glory. And a different way of saying their high position, he says, you should glory in your humiliation. And we said, well, what is that? Well, James explains that in verse 11. Uh, end of chapter, uh, verse 10 and 11, he says, what is this humiliation? Well, this humiliation happens when rich brothers die and rich sisters die. Just like grass and the flowers, they fade. And so too, the rich person will fade away in the midst of their pursuits. This rich brother or sister in Christ is going to die. And that's the humiliation. And then we ask, well, what happens to a rich brother or sister when they die? Well, from an earthly standpoint, they lose it all, right? Because you can't take it with you. But from an eternal standpoint, that's when they gain Christ. Practically, tangibly, where all the promises are, are, are fulfilled. So then, we ask these questions. And we notice that there's a lot of words to the rich. And we ask, why are there so many words to the rich? Four times as many words that James writes to the rich. Why is that? And the reason why we said is because being rich is a, a 
is a little known trial that people go through. Being rich is a little known trial that people go through. As we mentioned, the proverb writer understood this when he says, give me neither poverty nor riches. And if you stop and thought about that, you have to ask yourself, is that something that you would ask? Or would you just lean on, just don't give me poverty. Give me all the riches that you want, but just don't give me poverty. But the, the wise proverb writer understands that it's a trial to be rich. Then we ask the question number two, who are the rich? Well, the rich is anybody who has more than what they need. I try to suggest to you from a biblical standpoint that all of us here in this room should consider ourselves biblically rich because you all have more than you need. You have discretionary funds. Now, you might have locked up those discretionary funds in your mortgage and this and that and your car payments and all all this and so you might not feel like you have discretionary funds but you definitely didn't have to choose those things right you had the choice and so in first timothy 6 8 it says if we have food and covering with these we shall be content anything more than that you would be considered as rich Well, not to get caught up in that. Well, whether you consider yourself rich or poor or any anything else in between, you can even say, you know, there there wasn't really a middle class in in the Bible, but you can say you're supposed to do the same thing. You're supposed to glory. Well, now that we said why so many words to the rich, who are the rich? Then we asked, what makes being rich a trial? We said, if you are rich, if you have more than you need, you are very uh, tempted in your abundance to think and live that you don't need God, that you don't need God. And we track through different people in the Bible and even even, uh, in our recent history, Michael Jordan, where they demonstrated the fruits of being rich that they were satisfied without God. They started to see themselves more important than others. And so the last question that we went over last week was, why speak this way? Why speak this way to the rich? Well, it's because they're going to die. Because they're going to die. And rich brothers and rich sisters in Christ need to recognize that they are going to die. So, in this quote by John Owen, if you start to think, well, Pastor Eric, you're just taking the fun out of life. Can't be poor. Can't be rich. (laughs) Everything's a trial. There's no fun. And so I found this quote. It says, I wish you success in your business. I would propose nothing inconsistent with a due regard to it. But can I bound my desires for you within such narrow limits? So, so far, what John Owen's saying is, listen, I'm not trying to take the fun out of your life and steal the joy out of your life and just tell you everything's a trial. What he says is, I don't want to limit my desire for you to such a narrow, superficial limit. He continues on in his quote, Allow me to wish you more lasting riches, greater honors, and better pleasures than this world can afford. Alas, what a poor acquisition to be what is usually called a thriving man for a few years, and then to drop unawares into an unknown eternity. How often do we see that when a man has just compassed his point, made his fortune, and is about to sit down and enjoy all his heart can wish, he is hastily called away. What a contrast between living today in affluence and pleasure, regardless of that great God who has made us, and tomorrow perhaps to be summoned away to appear, naked and alone before his tribunal, to give an account of what we use, uh, of, uh, give an account what use we have made of the talents so long entrusted to us. I pray God to impress the thought upon your heart before it's too late. What is he saying? 
Just listen. I'm not trying to take out the fun. I'm not trying to say that you... He says, what I want for you is, is a greater thing, a far greater thing. How can I wish for something really, really small to you when I know that there are great, weightier blessings, eternal blessings, blessings that will never fade away? How can I not wish those things for you? And if I do that, then hopefully your appetite and your desire and your heart would shift towards the eternal blessing. This is why we talk to the rich the way that we do. And so where we, we didn't get to, but uh, someone in Tuesday night asked, it comes down to what Jesus taught in Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Whatever you're prizing, whatever you're treasuring, that's where your heart is. But then, in light of all that we've talked about and what God says, what is your treasure? Where is your heart? Other ways to ask that question, what is the basis of your confidence in life? The reason why you are confident that you just, I know that what life is about, what is it at all? The reason why you can... Uh, withstand trials, financial trials or whatever is because, is it because of your bank account? Is it because of your retirement? Is it the reason why you can withstand relational trials is because you have a really great set of friends? What is your hope in life? What is the brightest beacon that draws your heart? Or from a different standpoint, what gets the strongest reaction from you if you lose it, or you might lose it. Is it your friends? Is it your health? Is it your beauty? Is it your success? Is it your intellect, your resume, your diploma? Is it your abilities and skills? Is it your freedom? Is it this country? Where is the beacon of your heart's desire? Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be open. And see, as we come to this passage, James continues to impart wisdom to us such that it reflects what Thomas Brooks says. He says, hope can see heaven through the thickest clouds. Hope can see heaven through the thickest clouds. And even in the Psalm 140, as was read to us, it was really rough times, surrounded by enemies, but this psalmist kept crying out to God. Kept crying out to God, knowing that he would not leave the afflicted uncared for. He would not let injustice go even in, um, in this uh, course. This is recommended to everybody. It's a free course put out by um, uh, training leaders, uh, no, uh, Institute of Leaders, Church Leadership. Anyways, we can put out the email um, on El Vanto. But there's a free course on hermeneutics done by Abner Chow, not related to me. Um, and he mentioned kind of the historical background of Lamentations. Lamentations is where we have that, uh, that uh, passage where it talks about um, that God is faithful and great is his faith. But to recognize that Jeremiah was writing that during a time when they were deported, where Israel was losing, where kids were being killed and smashed on walls, and during those dire circumstances by faith and in his hope in God, he says, God is still greatly faithful. He has not lied to us. His promises are not broken and void. He's faithful and he won't. So in light of the book of James, I would modify this quote and say, a joyful, faith-filled hope can see and glory in Christ Jesus, not only through the thickest clouds of sorrow and pain, but also 
through the artificial and fleeting flashes of earthly riches and abundance. If you're going through times of sorrow and pain, the dark clouds of providence are overshadowing you. A joyful, faith-filled life can see Christ and glory in him in your high position. If you have been afforded affluence and more than you need, you will not be deterred and distracted. You can still see that Christ is the greater treasure than any treasure that this world can ever offer. So, let's move on to question number five. As we try to identify who are the rich, I stopped and asked myself, well, what are, what are some characteristics of the rich who don't glory in their humiliation? How can we start to identify when we're starting to veer off from rich brothers, glory in your humiliation because you're going to die? Because you will fade away. Well, we mentioned some of these before, but some characteristics of the rich who don't glory in their humiliation, they tend to be particular and demanding. Everything has to be just so. Characteristics of rich who don't glory in their humiliation, they don't glory in the fact that one day they're going to lose it all, tend to be entitled. Those of you who are older who have kids or nephews, you start to bewail the fact that kids are so entitled today, right? They think that they deserve it. When you, in your lifetime, had to work for it, and you worked hard for it, and all these young whippersnappers come up and say, give it, give it. How come you're not giving it to me? Give it to me. You're so unfair. You're so mean. Because you didn't. They tend to be pushy, patient. They get angry when they don't get what they want, how they want it, when they want it. They expect that the state that they are in to continue without change. Generally, they're ungrateful, they're unappreciative, disrespectful, demeaning, or condescending to those that they deem lower than themselves. Right? If your money can buy you whatever you want, you start to see people as your slaves, your servants. Give me this food, this hot, this fast. Give me this car. Give me this house. I don't like this color. Give me this. Don't give me that. Keep this away. And you pay people to do what you want. And then you do that enough. If you're not careful, you'll start to be condescending. Sometimes they're aloof or uncaring of others. And they forget what Henry Law says. You may have wealth. It cannot profit long. You may have health. Decay will cause its flower to fade. You may have strength. It will soon totter to the grave. You may have honors. A breath will blast them. You may have flattering friends. They are but a, a summer brook. These boasted joys often now cover an aching heart, but they never gave a grain of solid peace. They never healed a wounded conscience. They never won approving looks from God. They never crushed the sting of sin. So if you heard these descriptions, at least in my mind, of characteristics of those rich who do not glory in their humiliation, that they, they don't look forward to and recognize that one day they're going to lose it all, and that will be the greatest day. If you start to see yourself in that, consider again, what is it that your riches will give you? And consider again, in light of the gospel, what is and should be your great treasure. So now, our last and final question, or second to last question, one world will spend the most. What should the rich do? Well, from James, they should glory in their humiliation. But what does that look like? 
What does that look like? We can press that a little bit more. What does the Bible say that the rich should do? Well, in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19, Jesus teaches and says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Literally, it's do not treasure up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So again, ask yourself, what is it that you treasure? And do you treasure something that will last for eternity? Or is it something that will eventually rust, break, or someone can steal it? What should the rich do? They should treasure up treasures in heaven. <laughs> I laugh because uh, there was one time I preached this passage and I kept preaching, store for yourselves treasures on earth, not in heaven. I just mentally, it sounded right coming out of my, in my mind, but in my mouth, it kept coming out wrong the whole sermon. And then I think one of my kids told me um, later on. That's why I buckle. So I, I really wanted to, Make sure that I got it right. So store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, not on earth. What else should the rich do? They shouldn't worry. Not because they have an abundance of things. Not because they know where their next meal is coming from and the next three months of meals. Not because they have a closet full of clothes that if the clothes that they're wearing uh, of get tattered and, and are well-worn, that you have you know, choice A through Z of what else to wear. It's not because of that. You shouldn't worry because your father knows what you need. And so therefore, you should seek first his kingdom. Verse 33 of Matthew 6. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Because your status can change in it. Remember the Israelites? Um, the Israelites during this time, there's a time when they had an abundance and they, they, they were back in the land. They started to rebuild the temple and they started to shift over to focusing on their own things. Instead of building the God's house, they started to build their own. Remember? And so what they would do is to, to try and say, well, you know, we got to take care of ourselves first is kind of the idea. And then we'll, then we'll give the leftovers to God. And God says, no, 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 that's not going to happen. But they, they kept trying. And so what they did is they bought more fields. They, they bought more stuff and they expanded their agricultural business. And they, they did all these things. And they try to, you know, not frivolously spend their money, but to save it and put it in their, uh, their money pouch. And what God says is, when you planted, I blew it away. When you put it in your money pouch, I put a hole in it, and it started to drain away. And God says, I did. I did that. Just because you have riches, and just because you have a FDIC-insured thing, and it doesn't mean that God can't blow it away. Just because you have a closet full of clothes doesn't mean that God can't take it away in a fire. One of the, one of the speakers that we had invited that we still have in, uh, plans to invite for our upcoming retreat, willing, is Pastor Bobby Scott. And there's a time when he woke up to the smell of smoke. And there's a fire that started on his other side of the house. And he says, all he did was, was able to get all of his family out, and that's it. So I didn't even bring a, get a toothbrush or comb. Like, everything was gone in an instant. There's no guarantee that that won't happen to any of us. Earthquake. Name any, like, some wildfire that goes crazy. We ought not to worry. 
we ought not to worry. Because we can focus on seeking first God's kingdom. Now, if that was a little bit too high and conceptual for you, turn or look up in the screen to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. Because as Paul's ending this first letter to Timothy, Timothy's sent to Ephesus. He's supposed to, to make things right and, 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 and to lead the leadership there and to, to put things in order to, to instruct them how they ought to handle themselves in the household of God. He finishes and warns Timothy about the dangers of the love of money. And then... At the end of chapter 6, he gives instructions to the rich, starting in verse 17. And he tells Timothy this, instruct those who are rich in this present world. Okay? So he's focusing on those who are affluent, who have money, who have property, livestock, things. They're rich in this present world. He says, instruct them, instruct them. Now, notice that It's not ungodly to be rich. I I have to stress that. Even though it's a trial to be rich, it's not ungodly to be rich. Rich people should do this. What should they do? Number one, they should not be conceited. Literally, it's not be high-minded. Listen, if you have more than you need, don't think more highly than you ought. Think about millennials, right? Think about, you know, in, entitled teenagers. Don't be like that in any way. Don't think that you deserve. If you're rich in this present world, don't be conceited. Number two, don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches. Just instruct them not to be conceded, or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. I think the Proverbs writer says that riches are like a bird, that if you look at them, they'll fly away. Riches are so uncertain. They can be taken so quickly, either by some thief, some hacker, some this, some disaster, or just breakdown after breakdown after breakdown. In my house, it was car broke down, then mold in the mold in the shower, and this and that and these things, and those things pile up. Everything can change, so don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches because you might die. You might die. Well, those are the negative things. What are the positive things? Don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but fix your hope on God. You should fix your hope on God. Now, notice how he describes God. The God who richly supplies us with all things. Now, think of all the ways that Paul could have described God. Fix your hope on God, the one who justifies you when you were dead in your trespasses and sins. He could have described in that way. Fix your hope on God, who is greatly faithful. Fix your hope on God, who is holy, holy, holy. Fix your hope on God, who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. But look at what he did say. Who richly supplies us with all things to what? To enjoy. To enjoy. Listen, if you are rich in this, in this age, if you are rich in this present world, know that that came to you from God, who is described as a God who supplies you richly with things to enjoy. It's okay to enjoy a really nice meal. It's okay to enjoy a good vacation. It's okay. As long as you're not high-minded, you're not fixing your hope on the uncertainty of riches, and you're doing these infinitives, 
Infinite is our to, like, to run, to walk, right? Instruct them, verse 18, to do good. Do that which is noble, honorable. To be rich in good works. So it's not just the doing of good, but be rich in the doing of good. As much as you are overflowing and have ample supply of supplies, be overflowing and have ample works that, uh, that are good that you do. Instruct them to do good. Number two, to be rich in good works, to be generous. Don't be stingy. Don't be stingy. Give. Be generous. Like uh, in my household, you know, when we there's some things that that my family loves. Like chips is one of them, and um, you know, if one one person like Funyuns is like the is like gold in my house. And so then, if someone has Funyuns and they they and the, you know, invariably they don't have enough Funyuns in this mix. And invariably, what happens is one child will have more Funyuns than everybody else, or they will find this. Recently, they found. Two bags of Funyuns. They're like, what? Where did you find it? It's like they found gold. And so then, if that happens, and, you know, the ones who do not have suddenly have the puppy dog look, and it's like, hey, I have some. And the ones who do are like, oh, man. And so you know what happens? They reach in there. I'm the smallest Funyun that there ever was. And they're like, here. Because they know mom and dad are like, hey, listen, God did not give you things to be selfish, right? God did not give you things to be selfish. He gave you things so that you can enjoy it, yes, but more so to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share. God didn't give you things so that you can just spend it on yourself. That's what we say in our home. They're trying to reflect this. And so they know if they don't give it all, like, no, that Funyun bag is gone. Like, all right then? That's not why God gave you that. So then they know, so then they say, here. I'm like, okay, good, you gave. You, you didn't say no. But then I ask, is that being generous? Then their face falls. Oh. I know what generous means, and so do you. You know what generous means. That doesn't mean empty your bank account all the time because there are lots of other needs that you have, caring for your family, caring for others, right? If you're going to, say, give to the Tangs, that doesn't mean to necessarily empty your bank account for the Tangs because we also know the Hadzis or the Canes if you support them or Maxwell in Ghana or whoever But you know what it means to be generous. Don't be stingy. And then ready to share. Ready to share. That you're looking, eager, for opportunities to share what you have with others. Notice, in all of these in all of these positive things that the rich in this present world, brothers and sisters in Christ should do. Notice, if on the right hand, these are the things that come back to you. In God's description, he richly supplies you with all things to enjoy. You can enjoy, right? You are biblically free to enjoy things from God and give him glory, give him thanks. But on this other hand, here are the things that kind of go out from you, right? Doing good, which you can enjoy, right? more blessed to give than to receive. To be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share. So if you're rich in this present age, now this is a kind of superficial four to one as a kind of starting ratio, four to one, let your riches go four to one to doing good and being ready to share and one to enjoy, right? 
Now, it doesn't have to be that way. You can do more. You can do less. But if you have this heart, you've got to start somewhere, right? Notice, as they're doing that, verse 18, in 19, if they're doing good, being rich in good works, being ready, generous and ready to share, what they're doing is, in verse 19, they're storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. That storing up is 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 a different is is a root word of 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 treasuring that's found in Matthew six nineteen and verse twenty one, but with a a prefix on it to make it more intensive. So to store treasure up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. Doesn't that sound like seek first God's kingdom? Doesn't that sound like glory in your humiliation? Because if you do that, the purpose of that is so that you may take hold of life. Well, quickly. What should the rich do? What the rich should do, glory in their humiliation. Seek first God's kingdom. Treasure up treasures in heaven. Do good. Be rich in good works. Be generous and ready to share. Because if you do that, then you're expressing like, one day I'm going to lose it all. And so you have the joy and the privilege and the blessing of losing it all of your own free will for the progress of the gospel and the glory of Christ. Well, there are people who did this. uh, Question number seven. Last question. Who are people that we can look to that did glory in their humiliation? Well, the people who did, you can find them in Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So whatever rewards are here on earth, you say, you know what? Those aren't the rewards I'm seeking after. I believe in the God who is a rewarder of those who seek him. And so then the author of Hebrews writes and says, right after this, he says, verse 7, By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemn the world became an heir of the righteousness i mean when you think about noah and the flood you have to really work hard to remove your mind of those christian bookstores you know rainbow animals sticking their heads out of the ark and everybody's happy this was noah spending 100 years building the mass a massive boat a massive boat bigger than this building in the middle of land talking about rain most likely that has never rained before and for a hundred years noah and his family are doing this they became the spectacle of the world because all of them came down <laughs> let's go check out noah i i imagine it might have been like a family vacation. Let's go check out crazy old Noah and his family building that dumb ark. Anyways, I have theories of why that would be. Um, anyways, talk to me. Up. And what he did was, he says, instead of going along with them, which would be much easier, I'm going to trust in God and build this ark. I'm going to condemn the world. Moses, verse 24, Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. He was looking to reward. Who gloried in their humiliation? Moses did. 
listen, I could have all the privilege of being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. The Egyptian empire lasted thousands of years, thousands, and they were the, they were the thing. They were the biggest empire for thousands of years, and he could have been a part of that. And he said, no. I'd rather throw in my lot with these stinky shepherd farmers in the land of Midian. But you could have all these treasures. You could have all these riches. If you go with them, you're just going to get reproaches. Right now, they have to make bricks without straw. Right now, they are slaves of the empire. And you're going to give up this? Yeah, I don't want that. In Hebrews 11, he says, he considered the reproach of the Messiah greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Worth considering, meditating on. Who else? Asaph. You know, in Psalm 73, you mentioned it last week, where he's jealous, like, why are the wicked prospering? I'm trying to be, you know, keep my hands pure and, and keep my life pure, and I'm being, feel like I'm being beat up and down the street. But all these other people who are rich and they acquire riches and they're wicked, their life is easy. And then he sees their end, and he turns. He says, when I used to think like that, I thought like an animal, just a brute animal. Now at the end, he says, Whom ha have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me... The nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge. Oh, listen, you can give me all the riches of the world, but then in the end, if I'm far from you, God, I'm going to perish. If I'm unfaithful to you, you're going to destroy me. And what will those riches do for me? Nothing. But what's good for me? What I want to be near to me is you. You can look at Psalm 63, Psalm 23. But who is the one par excellence who gloried in his humiliation? Jesus. As we come before the table, we remind ourselves that Jesus gloried in his humiliation. He held his head up high, walking, having humbled himself and emptied himself. Listen again to Philippians 2. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in the Messiah Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be held on to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In Hebrews 12, it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the And lastly, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now at this point, the grace of our Lord Jesus is not that he had lots and lots of money in heaven and he left it and then he became poor and didn't have a whole lot of money. It's true that he, foxes had holes and birds of the air had a nest, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. But that's not the poverty that he endured. His poverty was leaving the glories of heaven, becoming and being made in the likeness of taking the form of a bondser. He gloried in that, never wavered. He held up his head high, 
in his humiliation. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might be. And that is what we celebrate at the table with these elements. So, as we consider, let me pray for us and as I invite the music team to come up. To pray for us as we come before the Lord's table, that we would be those who reflect Christ, who had riches, riches beyond our wildest imagination, more than just earthly financial riches. He was rich in glory. He became poor, might become rich. Well, let me pray. Father, we're grateful to you. Thank you, Lord, for Christ, who always and ever sets the example of what it means for rich brothers and sisters to glory in their humility. One day we will lose it all. There's nothing here in this world that we ought to treasure and hold on to tightly. We should hold on to Christ. Christ alone. He showed us that and died on the cross in our place so that we might not just have an example of what should be done, but be given grace sufficient. We might be forgiven when we haven't changed so that one day we will, without sin, treasure you and love you with our heart, soul, mind, and soul. Help us towards that end. In Christ's name.